I'm very pleased to uh, open the last session of this uh, one day meeting. And uh, the last session has the undecisive title of uh, the future of memory. In language, in everyday language, memory usually has the connotation of referring to the past. In fact, as a memory investigator, I should tell you that memory is not about the past. It's about the present and the future. Because, and it's probably not something new to you, we use the information that we think is memory to behave in the, past, in the, in the, in, in the present. And uh, for those who are not in brain research, uh, you should probably know that in most of the cases we assume and sometimes we know that the brain predicts the action about 0.2 seconds before it happens and sometimes longer than that. So we are, our brain is always geared to consider the future, which is an interesting notion because this means that the brain must have some kind of internal representations or pre-representations to be selected by the conditions in which we work, but we don't have time to go into it. But if you wish to contemplate it, not during the lectures afterwards, <coughs> then uh, this relates to the a Darwinian way of looking at the brain. Because it seems like the brain has some mutations in information and uh, the environment would select, not actively, but by selection, uh, the, those mutations or those representations or those units of knowledge that fit the environment. But this is another talk and this is another meeting, so we are looking forward to the next meeting on that. I am very happy to introduce, be able to introduce the two speakers of uh, this session. They come from very different uh, backgrounds in terms of uh, education and interest, but, they, uh, but it fits very well the notion and the concept of this meeting that we try uh, as the Israeli Academy to complement the natural sciences and uh, the humanities and social sciences. So the first speaker is, uh, and uh, since I don't remember well, I have to read a little bit, is uh, Professor Yossi Matias, who is uh, from Tel Aviv University, but also, and uh, maybe I should do it the other way, Professor Yossi Matias, who is a uh, Vice President in Google International, and if there is a single person in the audience that doesn't Google, uh, then we have a physician that deals with that later on. <laughs> and uh, amazingly, Yossi, it takes you a long time to reply to Yossi Matthias at Gmail. <laughs> but then I found out that if I write at Google.com, it works better. So I will uh, take a note. Uh, Yossi uh, is uh, working, is engineering in Google, at Google, working in, search, in the search organization on which my life depends. Uh, he's also the managing director of Google's research and development center in Israel. He's recipient of the Godel Prize, which is uh, probably the most, one of the most important prizes in computer sciences and mathematics, and for contribution to the analysis of big data and the field of streaming algorithms. Big data doesn't mean that you have a piece of data that is big. Big data means that's a lot of data. And Matthias established the Research and Development Center of Google Israel. He led the development of Google products such as Google Trends, Google Insights for Search, Google Suggests, and Google Visualization. He pioneered an initiative to bring the cultural in uh, heritage collections online, for which we are very grateful, such as the uh, Yad Vashem Holocaust Memorial Museum Archive, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are on, online already and beautiful, at least the ones that I saw, and uh, the Nelson Mandela Archive. So in a way, he uh, has a very major role in establishing uh, the memory of human culture, or the memory of the human species, which is very important. Uh, now, he's a computer science faculty at Tel Aviv University, and he worked previously in Bell Labs, and was a visiting professor at Stanford, and he published extensively and has over, inventor over 30 patents, and the rest is for Yossi. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me here for the introduction. 
So I thought I'll give a few comments about uh, memory and technology, and this is not about technology, which has to do with the, uh, the of course, the uh, our own memory, but how technology around us actually implies how we work about our personal and global memory and otherwise. Now, of course, when we talk about memory in Israel, <coughs> uh, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, as a, a, I guess in our collective memory, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it later, uh, is about the, uh, or heritage memory, is about our uh, memory on the Holocaust, which we all grew up on. So I'll start with, uh, indeed, uh, referring to this uh, project that I had the privilege to, uh, to work on in collaboration with Yad Vashem. And this was uh, a very simple project. It was a question of how do we bring the content of um, the photos and videos which already existed in the Yad Vashem archive and make them accessible to everybody. And this touches on one very important point about memory in general, which is it's not so much about what you store, it's a question of how you access it. It's a question of how available it is and when you can actually get to it. So this is a good example for content that they already had in their databases, but the question was how do we make them available for everybody? And we had the privilege to work with them and make them accessible. Uh, so this uh, depicts a page which essentially brought online 130,000 photos of Yad Vashem. And just by bringing them online over the internet, uh, this alone made some significant impact. Uh, obviously very rewarding from a personal perspective, getting an email from a person saying, here's a picture of my mother's grandfather, it's the first time we ever saw his picture. But even beyond that, uh, one of the fascinating phenomena observed was that when we open, opened it up for everybody to comment and tell their personal stories, we got in just a few months thousands of personal stories, people actually identifying other people. Uh, this is an example for a story of a woman identifying her mother and telling the personal stories. And in a way, it helped preserve the information that is otherwise going to be lost. And this opens up the question, how can we make more of that? How can we uh, use technology to preserve information, to make it accessible to everybody? Um, and, and indeed, after making this, um, uh, working on this project, we looked more broadly into the question, what kind of other collections should we bring online? And indeed, the next project that we had was with the Israel Antiquity Authority and with the Israel Museum. And this was about bringing the Dead Sea Scrolls online and make them accessible. So uh, historically, they were found <clears throat> some 70 years ago, but they were only accessible to a handful and by direct contact until a few years ago. And this was a project of trying to make them, bring them online, which they are now. So what we see here is a, a segment from the Isaiah scroll. <clears throat> and actually, if we, um, and this is now searchable, and if we, if we zoom in, you can actually see um, the, the, the content of that in a quality which is better than you would see with your naked eyes. And again, interestingly enough, uh, once we started bringing all the fragments online, and now uh, thousands of fragments, which currently are in the, were scanned using uh, some uh, uh, very uh, advanced technology uh, by the Israel Interpretive Authority, is now available for everybody to not only see, but actually every s fragment now became a subject for a uh, discussion which brings up the question about the future of scholar conversation. Beyond just published paper, publishing papers or attending conferences and looking at it at this level, there is a great opportunity now to take any artifact, any, any uh, element and have a conversation around it by scholars, by scientists or by everybody else who may want to contribute into that. And I've seen some conversations about some fragments coming up between the curator of the Israel Integrity Authority and some experts worldwide. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, indeed, after bringing online this collection, we worked with the, uh, on bringing online the Nelson Mandela archive, essentially all the letters that Nelson Mandela uh, was writing while in jail. And this was actually the basis for forming what we call now the Cultural Institute, which is based in Paris. And the idea behind the Cultural Institute, Cultural Institute was based on this project alongside with another project which is called the Art Project, um, which uh, started out in London. And uh, this was about how can we bring galleries and content online and make them available for everybody. And if you think about it, this is really opening up access to information, which is heritage or cultural information, uh, to everybody to experience or to recollect their experience. So, for example, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, pictures from the Metropolitan Museum by Brickell. And now, when you go to this picture, you can actually have an entirely different experience. Um, let me try 
to demonstrate it. Oh, it's <laughs> Ta -da. I guess we're not connected. That's fine. So we'll. <laughs> hmm? I know. Okay. I'm asked to refresh, so let's see. Okay. That looks like it. Thank you. So if you go there, actually, the technology enables you not only to view that, but also to view that in a way that is better than you could when you stand in a museum. Uh, in fact, you can actually zoom in and see things that you perhaps do not observe when you just watch uh, the big picture. And actually, uh, here in the background, there's a full detail picture that probably you wouldn't even notice, but it actually depicts a children game from the 16th century. I guess it's a pretty cruel game because I think this is a duck. Uh, but this is the kind of stuff that suddenly technology is not only enables you access the stuff that you could experience in real life, in fact, it's something that enables you to get something that you wouldn't otherwise experience. Uh, a true story, I was in Prado a few years ago. Uh, this was actually when we had our first pilot of a few pictures that were scanned with uh, a very high resolution there. And uh, there was this picture by Velasquez and the guide was talking about the picture and uh, describing the girl and the bee and the flower. And then she said, and if you'd like to see more details, go to Google. <laughs> So anyway, this is one example for how we can access information um, and to everybody. And, uh, and this, by the way, not about, only about heritage and about, uh, about culture. This is also true for exploring the world and access the world to places that you either forgot you've been there, you want to be there, or you could never go there. Uh, actually, this is a recent project where we uh, applied the same technology in Israel to the National Trail. And in fact, today, this was done just a few days ago, and again, I guess. All right, we'll give up on that. Um, and what it, I was actually carrying the camera on myself for uh, a day, which was uh, great. But the, the experience that everybody could get now is actually to go and experience places along the National Trail and see them in real life, which is pretty amazing experience and it's just at the beginning because now when you think about new technologies for virtual reality, uh, there are some classes that are doing field trip where every kid is wearing these uh, uh, virtual reality glasses and can actually experience going to Versailles or going to the Trail of Israel, going to the Amazonas, going to see a museum and this opens up the access and in a way if you think it's actually creating memory beyond what you uh, would even experience on your own. Uh, by the way, anybody, some people may be concerned about the fact that this may be replacing uh, the real life experience. Uh, reality shows that um, in many museums, there are actually more visitors after they, they are, uh, people are actually exposed to these pictures. And it's not surprising. If you go to the Louvre, you see that uh, there's this crowded, um, the, all this crowd uh, to come and see the Mona Lisa actually you can't see anything, right? It's behind uh, plastic, and uh, you, you, you cannot come too close, and it's not a very big picture. But everybody is coming there because they know of it. And similarly, it turns out this is true for many other experiences. And it's also known, of course, that uh, you know, people travel more to places that they actually get a great experience watching it in uh, using technology. So, um, so I think this is good. So with that, let me actually switch to search because that's something that is certainly on my mind quite a bit. And if you think about search, search is really about um, how do we access this vast amount of information? Because it's one thing to accumulate all this knowledge. It's one thing to have all these amazing, uh, uh, these, these billions of documents and photos and movies, etc. But how do I actually make use of it? And the magic of search is, a, is the idea that we should be able to get what we need in the right time. So this is the access to, to this kind of uh, huge memory that you will. So just a few kind of um, uh, recollection about where we are in search. This depicts kind of the growth of the web, which keeps on growing uh, in, a, in a way which is uh, more or less exponential. We also see growth in the internet users worldwide, uh, which already brings it up to uh, over 2 billion. Um, by the way, many of them now on, on a smartphone, which is another interesting phenomenon. And again, what makes this uh, useful is the fact that we can search for the right information and get it in the right time. Uh, so if we just uh, reflect a little bit on search technology, and uh, this was just 1998, and uh, uh, I don't know how many remember that, and uh, we've been working very hard on making progress on search 
since then. And every time that we make progress, it looks like this is what we need. And then, of course, we're just getting started. When I joined Google, this was 10 years ago almost, uh, I was asked, what, what is there, is there anything remaining to do in search? And of course, the, the kind of progress we've seen just in the last couple of years, I guess, is uh, more significant than I've seen many years earlier. And more broadly, when we think about technology, I think that the progress we did in the last five years is probably larger than we've seen in the preceding 20 years, uh, which is larger probably than in many, many years uh, before. And um, it's going to be interesting to watch what's going to be in the future, but so, certainly there's certain acceleration in progress, uh, which means essentially that uh, we cannot really predict about what's going on. We can just understand that things are going to be very different in the future than they are today. So just the numbers, we're talking about now 60 trillion web addresses, 3 billion searches per day, and 15% of them are new searches. So people are searching for keywords, for uh, questions that we never saw before. Every day, about 15%. Um, uh, we're talking about 20 billion sites crawled per day, 100 petabytes of information, which are essentially uh, four millennia of DVD playback, if you think about it. So a huge amount of knowledge. And the question is, how do we get access to what we actually need in just the right time? This is really the trick question, right? Uh, and, and again, our kind of thinking is that we're just getting started on that. And when we're talking about uh, visual uh, kind of content, we're talking just in 2015, there were about one trillion photos uploaded. And every minute there are hundreds of YouTube videos which are uploaded out there. So there's a huge amount of collective uh, storage and, and, uh, and recording of everything around us and the knowledge which is around us. And the question is, how do we make good use of that? And of course, there's a question of how do we get to this knowledge? So uh, smartphones, how many of you have uh, smartphones here? I guess, majority. Uh, and uh, this is relatively new technology. And I can assure you that in a few years, this will be an old technology. Because the way we're going to access information is going to be very different. It's going to be immersed in many ways. We're going to, we're going to see displays in various ways. We're still not sure exactly how it's going to be done, but it's surely going to be less intrusive, right? So for example, there's a phenomenon today of taking many pictures all the time, and this is probably going to go away once there's going to be more, better way to just record everything around us. And I'll touch on this point later on. So one important uh, aspect I talked, so search is about really accessing technology that we want to access. And even then, there's a lot of heavy technology to enable us to get just what we need because when we're searching for something, there are so many different things that could be relevant and the trick is how do we get, how do we get the right thing that is uh, important for us. But I, one fascinating aspect of search is really what is suggested to us. Namely, what are the things that actually we perhaps don't even know to ask but we can still be offered. And if you think about it, the power of memory in many cases is that we see something and then that we connect this, this fact to something else. This association is one of the most powerful phenomena that we have as humans. When we read something, when we listen to something, when we think about something, certainly as scientists, that's perhaps the most important thing, is to look at something and somehow uh, observe that there's something connected to that that may not be that obvious. Now, the technology, the power of technology is really getting us to the stage that we can start imitating some of these recollections, some of these initiatives. Uh, and, uh, and most significantly, the notion of machine learning, which is about um, uh, the technology that enables uh, the algorithms that are not specified about how to solve a problem, but actually they are learning on their own by observing a lot of data and trying to learn patterns by using uh, certain technologies such as uh, what is now called as deep learning. Uh, there's a, an NLP, the natural language processing, is important to really understand what's going on. So even today, we have no, no technologies. I don't know how many of you tried it, but you can actually ask uh, your phone a question, and it may be able to answer. Let me bravely try to do something, or stupidly. We'll see. When was the Eiffel Tower built? Construction for the Eiffel Tower started in January 28, 1887. Sure. <laughs> Who built it? <coughs> the Eiffel Tower was designed by Gustav Eiffel and Stephen Savestra. Okay, so you did a pretty good job in both understanding my question, actually transferring my voice into words, <coughs> understanding the question, getting into some knowledge base which tells it when Eiffel Tower was built. And actually my follow-up question was who built it? It actually understood that it refers to, now it actually... <coughs> One more question now. 
Um, it actually understood as if uh, uh, that I'm referring back to Eiffel Tower. It gave another answer, again, it's based on uh, something that we call the knowledge graph, where we try to actually understand the semantic of the world. So one effort that we have in search in the last uh, few years is not only tr index documents and try to look for phrases as they match these documents, but try to build a semantic understanding of the world, namely about people, places, things, and their interrelationships between them, which I think is very is fascinating because it's really the interrelationship between entities and concepts that actually form this knowledge. And then try to understand what, what does it mean for that. Now, uh, of course, there are many technologies in order to facilitate even this simple question. As I mentioned, to understand the voice, to use voice recognition, then to understand the semantic of the sentence, then to apply to the semantic graph uh, and bring back the answer. And then on the next question, to even connect, correct it to the context and, you, and understand that this is the context of the previous question. And this is, again, j just getting started on that. Uh, and more generally, what is called AI, artificial intelligence, which is a, um, a topic that has been discussed many years ago, and actually uh, it had it kind of its hype cycle a few, a couple of decades ago, and then a lot of disappointment because people realized that actually we're very far from that. We're now getting into a stage that finally, with the amount of um, power of computing, the amount of data that is used by those algorithms, and by new techniques, namely, uh, notably, what is now called deep learning, uh, there are many tasks previously thought of a, a, as aspirational AI that are now actually can be, com can be done uh, pretty well. So voice recognition is a such example. Image understanding is another one. Uh, just uh, recently there was a milestone of a computer uh, program that managed to uh, beat uh, a, a champion in Go, in the game of Go is another kind of milestone in the way of, uh, of doing this stuff. So some examples that I find magical when they work, and then again, these are just a glimpse into the future of uh, how technology is going to help us in our daily life. Uh, this is a very simple uh, kind of feature that currently is called Google Now, which essentially pops up on my phone and tells me, well, it's time to leave um, in order to get to my next meeting or to get to work, etc., etc. And and it's actually not very smart. It only needs to know that, um, I, that I go to work every day. It knows where I am. It, goes where, it knows where my work it is. Obviously, with any navigation software, if you look at any mapping uh, software, Waze or Google Maps or anything else, uh, it's easy to ask how long should it take now to get there. Now we even have the traffic information. So everything is pretty straightforward once you understand the details. And it's readily available, but the magic is that suddenly my phone can tell me it's now time to leave to your next meeting. And it kind of reminds me of the action that otherwise I would expect somebody else to do it for me. Or I would expect myself to think about it or remember that. And this kind of a glimpse into what can be done. Now, you know, something even more fascinating to me is something, is, is an experience that I have on my personal photos. Uh, there's this new feature now in an app called Photos that uh, brings me almost every day kind of a uh, throwback, kind of a collage of images from a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Unfortunately, I don't have many pictures be before that in this collection. This is an example for a picture that I just got uh, three years ago. My son, then in high school, uh, was doing his robotics in the first robotics competition. This was taken probably in the middle of the night. And this is kind of a, I find it very magical because it suddenly pops at me uh, in this case, the context is just that it happened three days ago today. But think about it that um, when he's going to be 20 years from now, perhaps introducing his n new invention of this uh, amazing robot someplace, he's going to get this kind of recollection about what he was doing 30 years earlier or 20 years earlier. Uh, think about the fact that you could actually have these memories coming to you proactively just by these connections. So some of it may be just, well, today, 20 years ago, today, 10 years ago. This is a simple connotation. This is a simple context. But you can think about other contexts as well. You meet somebody. You're getting a reminder about, oh, last time we met, last time we spoke about. Uh, you think about a subject, brings back. You talk about a musical, brings back about your experience. Think about the possibilities here that their memory is there, and actually there are the ways to surface them just in the right time for you to watch or to experience or to remind you. I think it's extremely powerful and we're just kind of getting a glimpse on that. Uh, Michael, by the way, is now serving in the IDF, so this is already kind of big change from, uh, from his uh, uh, high school experience to today. 
So a few thoughts, uh, I'll, I'll try to um, end with a few thoughts and questions about implications of technology, which I think, and again, much of it is really for us to almost speculate, but I think there are pretty f profound implications of how technology can, uh, can really imply how we interact with our, with our present, with our past, uh, how it's actually going to influence our future. Uh, so first, let me make an assertion. I, claim that technology may, is making us smarter. And I know this is controversial because some people actually are concerned that with the use of technology, perhaps people are not as smart as before. Uh, technology is doing some of the job for them. And it's true for some extent, right? So I see kids today that are using only navigation program uh, software that perhaps are not going to understand, they're not going to know how to uh, drive in the city the way as well as we did. Uh, that's for sure. On the other hand, of course, uh, I remember as a, as a young pilot in the Israeli Air Force, uh, the old timers used to kind of uh, uh, talk down at us about the fact that we are already limited because we're using some navigational systems that were not available when they were, they actually could navigate by stars and the sun, right? And this is a skill that we totally did not have. So yes, we're losing some skills, but the fact that we leverage on technology to, uh, to, to do the stuff that we do, is, I think, taking us to a higher level of skills. Uh, as an example, I remember that um, I heard concerns that in school, kids today can easily just grab a few paragraphs from here and there and put some text and actually put it in a very nice document. It looks the kind of stuff that we, when we were younger, this was the masterpiece, was to actually see something formatted in the right typeset, right? Today, this is something you do in just a few minutes and very easily you can accumulate stuff. And this is true. However, this raises the bar of what we should expect of kids to do. So today I expect kids to actually do the kind of research. I expect them to provide their originality. I, ex I expect them to leverage on all these capabilities and then give a product that previously I expected somebody who's mu much more mature. So it does require our social adjustment uh, in terms of our expectations on any level. Another comment is that any desired user behavior can be in, in, imitated. So I remember I was sitting in a panel a couple of years ago, actually in, a, a, in the Jewish Museum in um, Berlin. There was a conference about heritage and the future of research. And one concern I heard from a scholar was that uh, she was saying that she, as a student, used to come to the library and just the action of going and browsing, etc., was very important for her research. Uh, because she discovered all the serendipity aspect of finding the stuff that she did not expect was important and she expressed concern about the fact that now with search technology you can actually get what you want to and perhaps you're missing on this uh, serendipity. So my argument is that technology can actually imitate it. In fact, there are now two very successful Israeli companies, startup companies, uh, that uh, their business is really based on the fact that when you read an article, a newspaper article online, it suggests to you other related articles. And this serendipity stuff, and obviously they are very successful because people are actually buying into that, they are actually reading those related articles. So technology can imitate any behavior that we used to, and a lot of what we are fearing about losing, I would argue, is a nostalgia. Now, of course, we need to do the right adjustments in order to leverage this technology properly. Uh, I would argue that uh, technology can serve, uh, with technology we can actually serve as a trusted friend, partner, advisor, assistant, etc. Uh, just because this magic of surfacing what you need just in the right time, um, once we understand uh, by technology what is needed by, by the user, and can provide this magical moment, can um, help you identify, uh, there are some um, various uh, efforts to try and schedule for people the right timing for them to do their daily exercise or the, to find the business schedule, time to read the book, etc., etc. And, uh, and I believe this is, can, can be really very powerful. And of course, as a, an important footnote, this is the kind of acquaintance that we should be very careful about how we uh, use and not abuse. Uh, and obviously, for example, the notion of privacy is of utmost importance in anything which has to do with personalized information. Um, it can help with organizational, professional, and personal memory. Think about all those cases that you hear, and unfortunately, I'm sure many of us experience about loved ones that suffer just because when they go to the hospital, there's a lack of actually memory, organizational memory on their file. People don't remember the fact that they should actually get this, this medicine or they should not get this medicine. Or, and, 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 and I don't know how many of you experienced it that you actually need to be the ones who 
maintain the memory of your loved ones during these kind of situations, which, which is, of course, crazy. So technology can easily save that, of course. But beyond that, uh, I read an article about a doctor saying that with technology, he can actually make sure that he has the right understanding of the latest and greatest research related to a particular uh, condition where there's no chance in the world that he could personally still absorb everything, all the progress being made and be uh, as good of a doctor as he'd like to be. So I think technology can really help on that. And of course, you can think about how it can assist those who suffer from memory loss, Alzheimer, etc. Uh, obviously, if you use technology to be the ones that uh, help them uh, remind in the right time, etc., I think there, the possibilities are endless. Um, obviously, it can transform the way we experience and remember heritage and culture. And again, I touched on that earlier on. But think about the situation that when you read about history or when you want to learn more about any topic, the level of experience is in different level. And think about 30 years from now that the fact that everybody can experience a lot of what's going on today just because we have all this documentation and we have the technology to surface it in the right time in the right place. Um, now, a good question, I guess, and this I put it in a question mark, is how about the power of filtering and forgetting? Uh, forgetting is an important aspect, I guess, of human nature and, uh, and perhaps collectively. Uh, so this is one aspect that obviously does not, uh, is going to bring up this question. And filtering, uh, and again, uh, presumably, having the right memory of what happened is an important one. Uh, we are going to lose some of the benefits of remembering things as we'd like to, uh, perhaps. And finally, what are the implications uh, when everything could be recorded? So in a way, a lot is already recorded. I just had a chat earlier uh, in the corridor about um, uh, the fact that uh, I, I heard that there was a discussion about our memory from kindergarten is changing every world, every, every five years. And my question is, well, think about kids today who go to the kindergarten. In 20, 30, 40 years, they cannot invent their kindergarten time because it's already been recorded pretty well. So, uh, and this recording is going to be even more so in the future. So what is going to be the implication that everything is recorded? What is going to be the implication that you can easily go back and see, here's how I was actually in kindergarten, here's what I remember. How is it going to influence what I remember? Because uh, much in the same way that we look at uh, uh, old albums and pictures and somehow the pictures become our memory, what is it going to do where everything is actually going to be accessible? So I think these are uh, important questions. Uh, final note, with all this information and memory which is going to be available, I think there's an utmost importance for the art and the science of summarization and sketching and representing it in an art form. So the notion of sketching, for example, um, Leonardo da Vinci, who obviously was the artist who worked on the details of every picture to the extent that uh, I saw this exhibition, Louvre once, uh, of the 13 versions uh, reconstructed of a picture. And then, um, but I admire his work on sketching, which uh, he has these hundreds of sketches, where in a few sketches you can capture uh, an image in a very succinct way. So I think this art of uh, sketching and summarization of, of a lot of this knowledge is going to be important, and obviously the art to describe it well. Thank you very much.